A boy dreams, and for the moment, the cattle in his charge wander the fenceless prairie. A boy dreams, briefly forgetting the rugged life of a pioneer family. A boy dreams, setting in motion one of the most amazing unsung stories in Canadian aviation. He was truly an inventor, no question about it. Gibson designed and built the first Canadian aircraft to qualify as having flown in Canada. I feel Gibson was far ahead of his time for the information that he had and that he had a very innovative mind. And he was also the first person in Canada to fly a Canadian built aircraft. William Wallace Gibson's story starts in Scotland. His father, William Wallace Gibson Sr., has his own dreams of flight, flight from a land where an ambitious stonemason can see no advancement, a land that offers only the small farms that the hated lairds and factors will rent him, or the filth and crowds of the cities. In 1876, his fourth of six children is born, and like himself, named for the Scottish rebel William Wallace. Wallace was the man that was credited with winning Scotland's freedom from England at one point. He was a warrior. And um, of course, the Scotch were made much of him. He was a hero. And uh, young Bill Gibson was extremely proud that he was named Wallace. And he always used that name. With a family and ambitions that seemed too big for an old land, the Gibson family set sail for Canada. They arrive in Quebec in 1883 and head west, settling on their allotted quarter section of virgin land. They are among the first settlers in an area named Moffat, south of Wolseley, district of Assiniboia, Northwest Territories. The next few years see them thrown into the rigorous world of pioneer farming. The elder Gibson meets the difficulties with equanimity. The northwest of Canada has many resources, and I do believe that in the future it will become a great country and a home for a great number of the human family. It was so much better than Scotland. Scotland, he was a peasant. All the lords. He, my grandfather hated the Lords. He was so pleased to go to Canada. I didn't regret the change I made. There's a freedom here from the power and the interference of the lairds and factors. Scotsmen in the old country would be thought subjects for the lunatic asylum if they talked of owning 500 acres of land. But not here. Here they all seem to walk more erect, hold their heads higher, and even look younger than they really are. <laughs> Billy Gibson, I think, was quite a character. Uh, he came out, out here from Scotland when he was only seven years old. I think he was one of these, he was born for the frontier. His father was a Scots Presbyterian and rather dour and rather serious, and very hard working, had a reputation for working his boys very hard. No immigrant coming here need think that he will find himself in a paradise. He may expect to have hard work, but he may expect this to be a blessing as he will be well remunerated for it. And it has long been known that a man at his work does not fall so readily into the hands of the devil as an idle one. Their labors produce the first stone house in the district and bountiful crops undreamed of in Scotland. 
Young Billy flourishes too, but not in the way his father envisions. Billy, I think, was a bit of a rebel. Let's say he was a rebel. <laughs> he didn't like taking orders too well. In a home where both the Bible and the biography of the rebel Wallace are required reading, Billy does his share of the work, but he takes every opportunity to slip away. It was as if he belonged out there in the wide open spaces, you know, and uh, he had that kind of imagination. My schooling lasted through the third grade, and then it fell to my lot to herd the cattle and horses. I used to range them on the border of the Indian Reservation. When the wind was from the west, I had very little herding to do, for cattle always graze into the breeze when the flies are bad. On these special days, I used to ride my pony to the Indian encampment and play with the boys. I mean, this was 1883 he came out here. And uh, they had no neighbors nearer than three miles. Uh, his nearest playmates were the Indian kids on the reserve. I think he enjoyed their free life, but he really felt sorry for them. All his life he'd tell me about the bad white men and in good Indians. These are the people of the great chief Piapot, Kisika Wawasum, flash in the sky. From these people, he learns to shoot a bow and arrow, and earns the name Jumping Deer for his prowess at the standing high jump. And it is from them that he learns a theology more appealing than his own. I used to wish I'd been born a papoose instead of a white baby, for they told me so many beautiful things about their happy hunting ground. It was always so green there, nothing could burn. That appealed to me because I had always been taught so much about a burning hell which bad boys are thrown into. He also had this wild dream that he was going to fly, which everybody thought was simply crazy. I don't know how young he was when he started that, but uh, we do know that when he was still a boy, he was making kites, and he was practicing with these kites. I would mount my pony and gallop him over the prairie, towing my kite just to see it fly. As a child, he was flying kites. He just had a feeling for air. And uh, he was doing it very scientifically. I mean, he was uh, making double kites and uh, tandem kites, and he was studying wind currents. But flying my kite without a breeze started me thinking, and I figured if I had some way of fastening power to a large kite, it would carry me through the heavens like a hawk, sweeping with a gopher in its claws. Gophers, in fact, take part in another experiment by the budding aviator. I designed a basket out of willow wands to cut air resistance and also to make the lower part a sort of observation room. I loaded it with nine gophers to celebrate the maiden flight of a seven-foot blue kite. On a beautiful day in May, I soon had the kite up. The blue sky was spangled with a few white clouds and a breeze was blowing that belonged to the prairie. All of a sudden, the basket broke away from the kite and crashed to earth, killing all nine gophers first air, air disaster in Canada. Billy Gibson is not the only prairie kid who wants to fly. There was another boy in our community who um, made himself a set of homemade wings and he jumped off a barn roof and broke a leg. Now you don't hear of Billy Gibson doing something that silly, you see. Elsewhere, others are pursuing dreams of flight. In 1884, the Englishman Horatio Phillips receives the patent for a two-surfaced airfoil. In 1889, an Australian, Lawrence Hargrave, builds the first aircraft rotary engine, but remains committed to certain natural principles of flight. In 1893, Horatio Phillips puts his ideas into a multiplane known as the Venetian Blind. The craft never flies. In 1900, Professor Langley, secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, is given a $50,000 grant by the Army to produce a flying machine. At the same time, the American engineer Octave Chanute is experimenting with gliders and sharing the information with other early bird men. The main benefactors are his friends, the Bicycle Building Brothers from Dayton, Ohio, 
Orville and Wilbur Wright. In 1900, Billy Gibson moves seven miles north of Moffat to the town of Wolseley. He learns the blacksmith trade. It's also in Wolseley that he first encounters 20th century technology. In 1901, he is the first man in the Northwest Territories to buy an automobile. He becomes an expert with its gasoline engine. When it's discovered that another man in the district also has a car, Gibson challenges him to the first auto race in the territories. The results, by all reports, are inconclusive. On December 17, 1903, another first comes to the attention of the whole world. Near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, with Orville Wright at the controls and his brother Wilbur operating the catapult, the first heavier-than-air machine takes to the air. Balgoni in 1903 is a small prairie collection of shops, a bank, doctors, lawyers, all serving the surrounding farm. It's the perfect place for Billy Gibson. He's a prosperous farmer and a hardware dealer in Balgoni. He is enterprising, opening branch stores in two nearby towns. For the moment, the flight by the Wright brothers has little effect on the world at large, but it does seize the interest of others who share that dream. Many are dabblers, looking for the easy way. In 1903, when I heard the Wright brothers had made a flight in a plane, I decided to do some experimenting myself. Success on the farm and in the hardware business gives Gibson the means to test his ideas. It's less than a year after Kitty Hawk. I had no idea what the Wright Brothers plane looked like, and it was about three years before I saw a picture of their machine in the papers. In 1904, I started to experiment on paper models. I got all my ideas from the kites I used to make and fly when I was a boy. I had been experimenting with models for over a year. The last ones I built were so stable, I could start them off upside down and they would rate themselves before they flew a distance of 15 feet. In a matter of months, with numerous gliding models already tested, he's ready for the next phase. Gibson, for what he was doing with the amount of information that he had, he was phenomenal. Orville Wright would have agreed. In a letter to Octave Chanute in 1900, he has written, I make no secret of my plans for the reason that the problem is too great for one man alone and unaided to solve in secret. But alone and unaided, Gibson carries on. I used a window blind roller as a backbone of the plane. I trimmed the spring ends of the roller and the solid part I cut down and wrapped the whole length with linen thread. I made a 10 inch propeller out of a Spanish mahogany. I then fashioned a starting chute to guide the skids of the model and varnished and polished it like glass. This I used for starting the model in flight. I also found that the torque of the propeller had a tendency to draw the models to one side while in flight and also to make them tilt. So I decided I would put two propellers running in opposite directions so as to counterbalance the torque and make the craft steer better. He probably didn't really know he was on the leading edge of aviation. It was the middle of June, 1904, on a Sunday, that I got up at daybreak and tried out my first model. I flew it from the roof of Billy Hyde's building, which was where I had my store. I put the chute in place, wound up the spring of the model, placed it on the guard, and let it go. It took to the air before it reached the end of the chute, flew across the street a distance of 130 feet, struck a boxcar that was standing on the side track, 
and damaged one of the wings. I had proved beyond a doubt that I could build a machine that would fly. Gibson's delight is tempered with discretion. He test flies mostly in the early morning. Dr. Kolbfleisch, who was out in the country early one morning, came in unnoticed by me while I was starting a model in flight. Later that day, when I opened my store, he came in and said, Billy, that was a funny looking bird you were trying to catch up on the roof this morning. I never saw any bird like that in my life. It flew right over my buggy and lit on the grass over by the station. I was afraid if my bankers heard of or saw me playing with such contraptions, they would think I'd gone clean crazy and call in their loan, and perhaps ruin my business. Also, at that time, the Northwest Mounted Police had the authority to pick up anyone reported queer and take them to Regina. In the first decade of the century, Gibson is not alone in Western Canada, but he is ahead. The three Underwood brothers near Stettler, Alberta, have been trying since early 1907. Their failure has less to do with science than with money. They never find the $1,300 to buy an engine. They are, however, able to use their motorless craft to lift their youngest brother John into the air. It's the first manned flight in Western Canada. Next door in Saskatchewan, a pair of brothers, George and Ace Pepper, begin experimenting with models before settling on the biplane concept. It has an additional idea that few designers have attempted yet, a propeller on the front, which pulls rather than pushes the machine. Further east at Brandon, Manitoba, William Straith will begin his flight experiments in 1912, putting together a biplane which makes a number of short flights before colliding with a wire, nearly ending Straith's life. But this is 1904. Billy Gibson continues his lonely venture. He's ready for his next step. I think in the back of his head, he knew he was going to fly. Uh, he was determined he was going to fly. And he wasn't going to just play around jumping off by roofs either. I now decided to build a man-carrying plane on my farm four miles south of Belgoni. I started to build a four-cylinder, four-cycle engine. He knows that this new venture will be costly, but financial freedom seems only a gamble away. One day, an old gentleman named Curry walked into my store and told me there was a great chance to make big money by taking a contract to build part of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. He called on me every day and pulled out his book and pencil to show me how much money I could make. He made the proposition look so bright, I took a contract for 20 miles north of Wolseley and another contract for 22 miles west of the Touchwood Hills. And he took the bright idea he wanted to be a millionaire, so he took out a contract to build part of a railroad, which was one of your quick ways to riches at the time. I lost $40,000 in 18 months. Gibson settles with the bank. The loss is the equivalent of $900,000 today. He's 29 years old. He has a wife and a young family to support. He looks elsewhere for a new start. It will be years before the prairies see Billy Gibson again. The railway building venture puts Billy Gibson out of business. He settles with his debtors and then packs up his family and heads to British Columbia, where his parents and siblings had already moved. He takes his partially built engine. He just packed it up and took it with him and went to the coast, and the west, uh, the prairie never saw him again, you see. He went out there and he built his plane in Victoria. I arrived in Victoria in the fall of 1906 and put a stop to my experiments for a time. In Victoria, Gibson encounters Zack Hamilton, an old friend from Regina. Zack had moved west and was doing a booming real estate business. 
To aid me in my business, I had acquired a cumbersome and immense vehicle known as a DeWinton. Having known William Gibson on the prairies as a good mechanic, we engaged him as skipper. The adventures he had with that car were truly remarkable. And he drove that car recklessly, you know, got into all kinds of mishaps. On one occasion, he knocked a Douglas streetcar clean off the track with it, severely wounding several people and emerging from the conflict with his head bloody but unbowed. He had the DeWinton running again long before the city of Victoria was able to repair the streetcar. But finally, the bill for the repairs to our chariot was so excessive we sold it to Gibson on time. Gibson's detour from his flight dreams is only temporary. He was still an airplane builder at heart. I completed my four-cylinder engine in Victoria, but it jumped around like a chicken with its head chopped off. So in the fall of 1907, I started to build a six-cylinder, two-cycle air-cooled engine. Money is a problem. Another scheme is needed. Fate brings Gibson together with a well-known Vancouver Island character, the logger and prospector Lockie Grant. Lockie brags of finding high-grade ore in the Leora mine near Clayoquot, and he carries an impressive gold nugget in his pocket to prove it. But he needs a backer. Gibson plays a hunch. He trades his car for a 17-foot boat and motor. Gibson and two acquaintances, who know as little of navigation in the open sea as he does, head up the coast for Lockie's claim 70 miles away. The trip takes eight days. Gibson loses 28 pounds. The Lord must have had some use for me, or he would never have allowed me to survive. Maybe it was my destiny. On arriving in Clayoquot, Gibson immediately buys the claim from Lockie in exchange for his boat, a rifle, his field glasses, a camera, and a hundred dollars in cash. And they set to work. Whatever angels have preserved Gibson on his trip north are still with him. In a few weeks, with Lockie's help, he has mined, milled, refined, and shaped a gold bar worth $1,200. With proof of the claim's value, he's able to sell it to speculators for $10,000. He's back in the aviation business. If money is the only thing needed to get a man into the air, there are much bigger interests at work on the east coast of Canada. Alexander Graham Bell has been experimenting with kites, flying wings and propellers since 1894 at his estate at Bedeck on Cape Breton Island. In 1907, his wife Mabel funds the Aerial Experiment Association. Its members, besides Bell, include two Americans, Glenn Curtis, later the founder of Curtis Aircraft, and Thomas Selfridge, an army man who has dedicated his life to unlocking the secrets of flight and who becomes the world's first air casualty in Florida a year later. And Douglas McCurdy, a young engineer from Toronto who will make his own historic flight in Canada a year later. Most likely unaware of these exploits, Gibson works on. He finds, however, that while money is no longer a problem, moral support is. When I started my experimenting again in Victoria, it was a heartbreaking struggle. I got encouragement from no one, not even my wife, and people held me in ridicule. I remember one man who always held up both his arms and flapped them whenever he saw me. Another would point to the sky, then cover his face. When I look back, I realize that I had a lot of nerve. Undaunted, Gibson has work to do. The first plane I built in Victoria, starting in 1908, was on the exact lines of the last model I built in Belgoni in 1904. The craft dubbed the twin plane is a machine like nothing the world has ever seen. Mr. Gibson didn't have access to the manuals and magazines and newspapers of the East showing what the Wright Flyer or the other aviation enthusiasts had been doing at the time. So his was an original concept, where the others were concepts built on the Wright Flyer idea. This is the Gibson twin plane. 
the wheels on the bottom of the airplane here, the four wheels, are were manufactured by Plimley Motors, or Plimley Carriage Works, which later became Plimley Motors. The airfoil designs on the cross sections were all airfoil shaped, which were really unheard of at the time, uh, to shape all the structure, everything leading into the aircraft, as a, into the wind as an airfoil shape. Rather than using mass for strength, he, he used wires and, and turnbuckles to achieve the strength, so he achieved a very strong, solid aircraft with very light weight. His training as a blacksmith is invaluable. If I'd not learned the blacksmith trade when a boy, I would never have been able to build the plane because I had to forge out all of my turnbuckles and thread them. Every metal part of the airplane I made myself. Design of the wings is a gull-shaped design, which were derived from his experiments with kites, and he put in four of them, which made the aircraft inherently stable. In my boyhood days, I had discovered that after the kite had been flown a while, the paper stretched and sagged. It formed a slight V-shape, and they flew much steadier without swaying or diving. There was a joystick, or a control stick in the aircraft, very rudimentary, that operated the elevator, which was at the front of the aircraft. And this large slab elevator at the front moved up and down, which gave the airplane its nose up or nose down attitude. It was while experimenting in Belgoni that I realized when a large rudder was set at a sharp angle, the models had a tendency to go into a side dive if there was a slight breeze blowing. Then I discovered by using two small rudders set apart that the models had much more stability. The rudders were controlled by the shoulder harnesses that the pilot wore uh, in the aircraft. The, the rudders turned from left to right, forcing the rear of the airplane around. And the saddle here, where the pilot sat, and he used the joystick to make the airplane uh, go up and down, or raise and lower in flight. Another Gibson first is his design of the fuel tanks. In the fuel tanks, there were baffles which helped, which stopped the fuel from surging back and forth. He was the first person to do that. Gibson again uses two propellers in line to counteract the torque. There was one in the front and the back of the engine, but the counter rotated to give stability to the aircraft. He again was the first person to incorporate that feature. I had to put a gear arrangement on one end of the crankshaft. This was geared to drive the rear propeller twice the speed of the forward one, which was 1,000 RPM, to give the rear propeller better grip on the air flowing from the front one. The engine shows some of the toil I spent. There are over 100 bolts in it, and I bored every one hollow so as to gain lightness. The twin plane construction is progressing rapidly. Billy Gibson has a chance to become the first man to fly in Canada. On February 23, 1909, Douglas McCurdy flies the American-built silver dart nearly a mile over the ice of Broadour Lake on Cape Breton Island. He is not only the first Canadian to fly on his native soil, but also the first British subject to fly at any point in the British Empire. By this time, Gibson is too engrossed in his own project to worry about what others are doing. He was trying to do something for himself, to please himself. He had a thought, an idea, a brainwave, and he tried to further that. There is now more than a passing interest in his work. On April 28, 1909, the Vancouver Daily Province reports, A. W. McVitie, the well-known surveyor of Victoria, tells of a neighbor of his who is building an aeroplane which he claims will rise absolutely without impetus. Mr. McVitie declines to disclose the name of the party, but says the inventor is willing to bet that inside of 18 months he will fly from Victoria to Vancouver in 20 minutes. And later that summer in the province, July 7, 1909, W. Gibson of this city has invented an aeroplane, which he expects to excel all others in existence. 
The inventor offers to bet that in a year he will fly to Seattle and Vancouver in his machine. The work continues throughout the winter. Gibson must feel optimistic. On March 9, 1910, the Victoria Daily Times reports, Zeppelin, Curtis, Wright Brothers, and Blériot will very soon be totally eclipsed when Victoria's flying man takes his machine out in about 60 days' time. A ship that cannot collapse, that can fly in a gale, that can be built to carry 50 men, and that can make a speed of 100 miles an hour is Victoria's latest invention. In the opinion of the inventor, it will be the style of ship used in the future. The work continues, and by September, it's ready for its first test. Gibson transports the twin plane by horse and cart to Dean's Farms on the outskirts of Victoria. With him is his old mining associate, Lockie Grant, always willing to lend a hand, and another Confederate known only as Dave, the banker, who lends much needed moral support. On September the 8th, with only a handful of spectators present, the twin plane makes a test flight. It's a short hop which ends when the wheels buckle. Everything else, however, indicates that the machine will fly. The Victoria Daily Colonist gives its blessing. September 9, 1910, William Gibson at last achieves success after experimenting with machine of his own invention for over two years. New wheels are installed two weeks later. Gibson, buoyed by the success of the first flight, makes sure a larger crowd of witnesses, including reporters, awaits the historic flight. It's early morning, September 24th, 1910. The twin plane is an impressive sight. Held together with a web of wires, turnbuckles and springs, its blue silk wings gleam in the sun as it's rolled from under its tent. Gibson, Lockie and Dave position it at the base of an incline. 54 feet in length and 20 feet wide. It's like nothing the world has seen, a machine of half the weight and twice the power of the first right flyer. Gibson's craft, based on the principles of over 20 years of solitary dreaming and experimentation and innovation, is about to test its wings. This is it. There's no turning back. Billy Gibson, 34 years of age, no flying experience places himself in the saddle. The motor barks to life. Lockie holds on to the tail of the brakeless craft. Years later, Gibson would relive that moment poetically. Both fear and hope that morning to the ride, as I drew the throttle cord full wide, then raised by hand the signal token that Lockie's grip be quickly broken. Like an eagle, with its wings outspread, Along the crest, with a roar, she fled. The experience is absolutely overwhelming when you climb into an airplane that you have built and you have constructed, and it actually gets into the air. And as the blade's air speed did heighten, her quivering form began to lighten. I raised her bill, it was eight feet wide. She rose right then in a lovely glide. A thrill of joy swept through my breast when I felt her leave the dewy crest. I know that he must have felt this overwhelming sense of elation when he actually got airborne. And he would probably, was very busy at the time trying to figure out what to do to make it go where he wanted it to. But at the same time, he would probably be looking around saying, I'm here, I'm up in the air. The crowd cheers as Gibson rises 30 feet and continues over the crown of the hill. Seldom has an aircraft flown so well and so far on its maiden flight. Gibson passes the Wright brothers' initial distance of 120 feet. The euphoria suddenly crumbles. But scarcely had her weight been lifted when swiftly to the right she drifted. A sudden crosswind throws the twin plane to the right Gibson reacts with his shoulders pulling at the rudder harness. It was not only too late, but in the wrong direction. I swung her tail and swung it strong, but in such haste I swung it wrong. 
In attempting to correct his course, Gibson has steered his aircraft towards a stand of oak trees. Still, with amazing poise, he cuts the engine and the twin plane settles to the ground. And then came down and actually made a very good landing. And, but the aircraft, being weighing a certain amount, traveled along the ground and having no brakes, not thinking of brakes in those days, but thinking of flying, he ran into an oak tree and the aircraft was totally demolished at that time. Gibson is thrown clear of the wreck. He lands near the engine, which is torn from its mounts and narrowly misses his head. He receives only two broken fingers and a cut that leaves a scar above his eye for life. The injuries to the twin plane, however, are fatal. The Victoria Daily Colonist. W.W. Gibson, the Victoria aviator, made a second flight yesterday with his twin plane. This flight showed once more the flying qualities of the machine, but it demonstrated also that while inventors may be born, aviators must be made. It is mid-morning, September the 24th, 1910. William Wallace Gibson, Jr. has just completed the first flight by a Canadian in a Canadian-built aircraft. It's a flight that's been an unqualified success until its conclusion, a collision with an oak tree. In fact, from beginning to end, he managed to take off, control the airplane, land the airplane, so the flight was great. The, the, the rollout wasn't so hot. As Billy Gibson surveys the wreckage of the twin plane, does he dwell on his oversight, the braking system, or does he recognize the achievements of his short flight? He has taken off up a slight incline. The Wright brothers have started their first flight on a level surface. He has taken off on his own power. The Wright brothers used a catapult. His engine has lifted the twin plane into the air after less than 50 feet. The Wright flyer had traveled 120 feet in its initial flight at Kitty Hawk. Gibson has flown nearly 200 feet. The craft has shown a natural stability. It has landed with no damage to the undercarriage. The twin plane design is completely original. But until it's rebuilt, its success is clouded. To this point, Gibson has had three essentials of an inventor. Money, patience, and faith in his ideas. He's now running short of all three. He sells his house in Victoria for $14,000. He starts to build a new aircraft based on the ideas of other inventors. The undercarriage, frame beams, and engine are salvaged from the twin plane, but the engine now drives a single pusher-type propeller. By the spring of 1911, Billy Gibson is ready to test his new concept, the Gibson multiplane. But the humidity of the west coast is threatening to warp the laminated wooden wings. Gibson ships the machine to a friend's farm south of Calgary. The Calgary Herald reports, August 8, 1911, with a machine that resembles very closely a western hay rack, two Canadian aviators are making short flights every afternoon five miles from the city. The article's full of Gibson bravado. Claims are made that the multiplane has already flown up to a mile in test flights. It's also claimed that the aircraft will fly just as well with or without a pilot. The pilot this time, however, is not Gibson. Before leaving Victoria, his wife has exacted a promise from him that he will never again risk his neck flying. He has three children to raise, and with no house, their existence is precarious. In Calgary, he hires Alex Jape to fly for him. Jape will be one of the first paid test pilots in Canada. Three days later, two reporters arrive on the scene. The Calgary Herald writes, while attempting to make a landing from a height of over 100 feet in the air during a flight yesterday afternoon, Alex Jape, an aviator working with W.W. Gibson, inventor of the multiplane airship, crashed down into a swampy coulee near this city and narrowly escaped death. 
His machine was badly wrecked. Gibson says he will rebuild his machine with pressed steel planes. But Gibson's claim is hollow. The era of his young life is over. He will not rebuild his aircraft. He will not realize any return on the nearly $40,000 he's invested in his flying machines. The flight dreams will never die, but they will never again be pursued with any hope. He had to make money. He saw he was not making any money with airplanes. So. Gibson returns to Victoria where he has no prospects. His only asset, the aircraft engine, is stored away. He just hated to give up. He wanted to stay with it, but financially it was too much. His marriage in these last years deteriorating as surely as his dreams of flight has crumbled. His thoughts are now exclusively of gold. In the next few years, Billy Gibson remarries and has three more children, among them William Wallace Gibson III. In the gold business, he has more successes than failures. That was around 1919, 1920, 21. They found $30,000 worth of gold in one day. I can remember my parents dancing around the pot of gold. Gibson finds the available mining machinery to be poorly designed and inefficient. He improves it. He registers his inventions in almost a hundred patents. This leads to his greatest financial success as a manufacturer of mining machinery. The Depression was came on in the 30s. Everybody was going mining. He has a commodity people need. While the rest of the world suffers through the dirty 30s, he becomes a millionaire. The inventor's mind is still fertile with thoughts of flight. He never did forget airplanes, and he always wanted to build another one. And he actually started several times. He made parts for airplanes as late as, oh, 1938. Spars and fuselages, but he never put one together. Billy Gibson's contribution to Canadian aviation has mostly sunk into obscurity except for the praise of a few aviation historians. I admire Gibson because he truly was ahead of his time. He was an innovator. He truly was a genius. I admire the man for his uh, ingenuity. Um, there was so very little known uh, about aircraft, uh, particularly where he lived. For somebody in Victoria, British Columbia, with no background, with little knowledge of what people had done in the past, he truly is something to be admired. Gibson's last 20 years see him receive some small recognition. Infrequent articles about his exploits appear in Canadian aviation magazines, and he will donate his aircraft engine to an honored place in the National Aeronautical Museum. But the greatest recognition in his lifetime comes from an unexpected source. In July, 1948, Gibson is asked to attend the unveiling of a monument in honor of his boyhood friend Chief Piapot on a reservation north of Regina. After the unveiling, there is a surprise for Gibson. He's invested as a full chief of the Cree Nation. At that time, he is one of only four non-natives ever given this distinction. And the Cree bestow on him the same honored name by which he knew Piapot. Kisika Wawasam, flash in the sky. Billy Gibson isn't remembered as the most successful of the Canadian birdmen. His work in flight was largely obscured, ignored, forgotten. And yet he had dreamed a dream that one day he would fly. And one day he did that. So when you struggle in life's race and fly about from place to place to measure miles at greater speed than fabled flight in books you read, or when you fly for pleasure's sake and cleave the sky your joy to make, remember once the pleasure sought was by your forebears dearly bought. Bear in your mind that doubtful day when birdmen nobly paved the way. <laughs> 